Hello and welcome to episode four of Giant Mess, show for Giants and Mets fans and for people who like to laugh at my pain and suffering, of which there are many. On this week's episode, we're going to talk about the Marcus Stroman trade. We're going to talk about the Jason Vargas trade and other possible trades involving Zach Wheeler, Noah Syndergaard, and Edwin Diaz, which will probably happen before this episode even hits the air gets published. We'll also talk about uh, the curse of Odell Beckham Jr. That is real. Giants receivers are dropping like flies. What's going on? What's in the water? Can we check the water? And we'll talk about some TV movies, The Sopranos, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and a whole lot more. So let's get started. Let's dive right into it. What a freaking week. One for the ages, folks. Where to begin? How to begin? It's the beginning of training camp for the Giants. Should we start with that? No. The Mets? Should we start with them? No. I got to ease into that stuff. Let's talk Sopranos real quick. Got a lot to talk about. Let's just dive into the Sopranos. I'm in season three. We're almost done with season three. And I'm warming up to it. First two seasons, yeah, on the fence. My wife, head over heels for this show. She loves Carmella. I don't know. Not a fan. That whole subplot with Meadow and Noah, the black Jew, the Jewish African American. What what what's the deal there? What are we talking about? Why? How? Who? What? Hmm? How does that relate to the show? And this is what I'm talking about with The Sopranos. And I get hammered over the head on a daily basis. This is the greatest show of all time. I'm not knocking you if you think that's the case. But it's taken a lot of foreplay. It's taken a lot of tickling of the nether regions for me to get tweaked, intrigued, if you will. All right? I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Usually it doesn't take much to get me aroused, but this show is testing me big time. I'm obsessed. The thing that I'm obsessed with the most, my wife loves the therapy sessions, and I'm thinking to myself, I don't know. I mean, this guy, is it anything getting through to him? You know? Is he just a rock, impenetrable? Or is he actually changing? Is he growing? Is what's her what's his character arc? That's where I'm coming from. That's what my degree in film and media studies gave me. The ability to critique and judge, to put on my white wig, to pick up my gavel, and to bang it. Sometimes probably not the best. Just sit back, relax, and enjoy the show, Neil. No, you can't do that. Your mind's ablaze on fire. It's a toxic wasteland. World War Three. But she loves the therapy sessions. Now that Carmela's in the therapy sessions, she loves it even more. Two of her favorite things. She says I'm ruining the show for her. I ruin a lot of things for a lot of people. That's just who I am. That's what I do. I don't like it. <laughs> but yeah, so Tony, you know, total hypocrite, right? He's fucking around with this chick and uh, the actress. Annabelle Ciora playing a Mercedes Benz dealer, which, you know, irony. I was just talking about Mercedes Benz drivers a couple week, weeks ago and their disposition. And now he's, he's having an affair with her as Jackie Jr. is having an affair on Meadow, cheating on Meadow with a stripper, I guess. I don't know. The whole Meadow subplot is just, it's, it's just nuts. I, I don't know if I, I don't, does it come into play later on? I think that's what happens with a lot of these older TV shows. They're like, well, we got 50 some odd minutes to fill. Might as well throw a meadow dating subplot in there. I feel like they have these storylines and then they just abandon them for weeks on end. We don't see them at all. And then they're just like, hey, remember this? Well, now this matters. Tough. It's tough. Like that Noah guy sucked, right? Big time. It was awful. Not a fan. Don't understand what was going on. At one point, I thought he was having an affair with Caitlin, the crazy chick, the blonde chick, the roommate from Meadows' roommate, who's pulling out her hair and like losing it, overseeing that the homeless person wear the New York Post as uh, underwear. You know, what's the deal with Caitlin? 
how is that coming into play? Is this like all reasons why Meadows going to just bounce and be like, screw college. I don't need this. And how does that play into what's going on with the family dynamic? I don't know. A lot of questions right now. And I'm an impatient person. Not a great quality to have. Needs to be a virtue of mine and I can't stand it. I can't wait to have patience. (laughs) If we're being honest. So, and then, you know, she goes from Noah, who's like this really studious, kind of pretentious dude, to Jackie Jr., who's not the smartest nut in the bunch. And that falls to pieces. Like, Jackie Jr., and maybe this is just like, it's Italian, I don't know. But the fact that, and I've done this in the past, where you just go head over heels for someone, and you go all in, and you're saying love way too quick. And then all of a sudden, it's like, it's over just like that. You can almost say the same for Tony and his uh, mistress, the Gloria chick played by Annabella Sciorra. Sciorra. I don't know how to say it. Hot and cold. Very uh, operatic. Soap operatic. I don't know if that's a word, but you can see the parallels. And then Tony, I say Tony's a hypocrite. Yeah. Big time. You're cheating on Carmela. You have always cheated on Carmela as far as I can remember. And I guess she's cool with it, but really, ultimately, she's not. And then you have the balls to like call Jackie Jr. with your daughter. I guess he can compartmentalize, which I cannot do. You know, he's got the wife and the guman. He can separate those two. But like Jackie Jr. can't do that. No one can do what you do, Tony. You know, my wife says he's a great leader. All right. Okay. I guess I can kind of see that. You know, I didn't know like great leaders fly off the handle and threaten with violence. I mean, (laughs) it's kind of a, you know, I can hear most of you say Trump. We're not going to get into that. This is not a political show, but there are parallels. (sighs) So I don't know. Season three finale. Maybe we'll watch it tonight. We'll see what happens there. I mean, I'm not. I'm, a, I'm more obsessed with how they eat. I mean, the level of pizza and pasta that these people consume is through the roof. I mean, carb overload. I mean, they must be running marathons on the daily to keep in shape. I had a pasta dish uh, last night, night before, and it was like I put on five pounds. I couldn't button my top button on my shirt. Thanks, pasta. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, I thought Noah and Caitlin were having an affair. I thought that was happening and then that wasn't happening. And I was like, okay, so where the fuck is this going? Ralphie, Joe Pantaleones, Joey Pants, just straight up murders, beats to death that, that Tracy, the stripper, who's like 20 and a mom and it has another kid inside her. I mean, I, I knew you always hear about people getting the, you hear the expression, Oh, he beat him to death. That usually means like a pipe was involved. Some kind of blunt object. No, this guy just went fists on this chick. And I was like blown away. You can do that. Wow. And of course, uh, I think it might've been the same episode. Uh, they have that like back VIP room where all the strippers hang out and do, things things which i've never had done but i know people who have had it done to them in the vip room I'm not going to name names tony they cut to him and he's getting the most aggressive blowjob i have ever seen in my life i don't even know how that's enjoyable neither of those people were enjoying that not the blowy not the blower so aggressive, so violent. What? What? Yikes, dude. Yikes. It, it almost reminded me of that. Uh, it might have been a sex scene in like Showgirls or Wild Things. Were they in the pool? Definitely not Wild Things. Although there was a sex scene in the pool in Wild Things. I'm talking about. Showgirls. 
they're like they're doing it in the pool and they're just thrashing around. You're like, this cannot be. No one's feeling good about this. That's what that <laughs> blowjob scene was. Ugh. And do the pro- do the producers hate Gladiator? <laughs> do they? Ralphie is a big time Gladiator fan. I can't be. I, I'm like blown away that Ralphie is still alive at this point. I mean, he's pretty much the reason that Jackie Jr. is MIA, which I think he got Jackie Jr. got whacked because he tells Jackie Jr. that story about how his dad and Tony had balls or showed balls by robbing an, a game, an illegal poker game, a card game for twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And then that's the stepping stone to becoming a made man. So then Jackie Jr. gets it in his head, like, oh, I'm going to rob one of Ralphie's games to join Christopher's crew. I don't know. The logic, the chain of logic in the show is just like, I'm still trying to wrap my head around the rules and whatnot, the guidelines and, and trying to figure out how that all works. Like, the mafia family, I guess, is more important than your immediate family. It's a cult, essentially. No two ways around it. But the producers have to hate Glad- Gladiator because Ralphie loves Gladiator and he's constantly quoting it and trying to like reenact scenes in that back VIP room. And Ralphie is not a likable character as far as, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. <sighs> It makes me think that one of the producers got like burned. Like he was supposed to be the producer in Gladiator and then he got fucked over. And now he's like, Hey, if you like Gladiator, you're a piece of shit like Ralphie. I'm probably thinking about that too much for being honest. So yeah, season three finale, hopefully tonight. Um, you know, I'm on, I'm still on the fence. I mean, it's better. It's definitely getting better, but you know, I made, we talked about it on our date night me and the wife we went on a date night and it was we got to eat some very rich foods and it was fun but we talked about the Sopranos and I talked about how I think Breaking Bad probably is a better show just from what I've seen so far I mean I was on a lot of painkillers when I watched Breaking Bad so that probably helped things I just had knee surgery so I was like I just binged the shit out of it on painkillers so I'm thinking the painkillers probably had something to do with it. So, I mean, you know, if anyone can tell me their favorite moments from the Sopranos from the first three seasons, that would be amazing. Cause right now it's, I'm not in love with it. I'm in like right now. I'm like, uh, yeah, we'll date for four or five years and then we'll end it in horrific fashion. Shout out Dane cook. So pathetic that I shout out Dan Cook. Let's talk about movies. Okay. It's the, I guess the 21st anniversary you can now legally drink. Congratulations to saving private Ryan, a, a movie, you know, uh, the, the late nineties, early two thousands were blur. Okay. I was in college. I, you know, I was out there just trying to get weird, you know, mixing it up with people, making bold claims, imbibing. You know, I didn't catch a lot of shit uh, back in the day. Saving Private Ryan was one of those movies that I just didn't watch until recently, like in the past year, probably Memorial Day of this year. Maybe last year. I don't know. No, this year. What a movie. Can't believe it was a movie. I cannot believe that was a movie. What? Is it, and it's based on a true story? Get the fuck out of here, dude. You're going to use all those goddamn resources to save one guy because he has brothers and they died. Not buying it. I mean, I, I bought it. I watched the whole movie, um, but suspending my disbelief, I was like, there's no way this happened in real life. And of course it did. I'm thinking to myself. So if this kid had what two brothers, are we going to fetch him? If he has one brother, are we going after his ass? No. And, and and for Tom Hanks to lose his life for this fucking douche. I mean, he's not a douche. I love, I you know, I said in previous episodes, I like looking at trivia after watching a movie or TV show. And one of the trivia points was pretty much the entire cast went to like a boot camp and training to prepare for the movie, except Matt Damon. And it was so everyone in the cast developed a distaste and contempt 
for Matt Damon. I mean, that's just quality movie making right there. <sighs> Saving Private Ryan was like three plus hours. And uh, people, so many goddamn soldiers lost their lives for that dude. So he can, I mean, uh, you gotta hope they show the family at the cemetery as he's like bowing down and honoring those that lost their lives, sacrificed for him. And you're gonna say to yourself, did any of you accomplish anything? For the love of God. And that'll tie in later to a certain thing that's going down with the Giants. So stay tuned for that. Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Came out 15 years ago. Whoa. One of the most underrated comedies of all time. I want to say top 10 for me. Top 10 comedies all time. Um, you know, the sequels were okay. But that original came out of nowhere. And really revitalized the White Castle franchise. I didn't even know they were still in existence. And then I was like, I need to get a sack or whatever it's called of these sliders. And, um, you know, I pretty much ended up like them. I got high and I couldn't find one. <laughs> but, uh, oh, what a great movie. And it's one of those movies like stoner comedies that makes you like no matter if you're you're a pothead or not stoner or not i mean it just it makes weed look so cool <laughs> it makes you want to try it and then you and then for me i do it and then it's like paranoia city everyone's looking at me the cops are coming bad news bears godspeed to anyone who can smoke or do whatever and and function I think I'm trying to act so normal and I'm acting so weird, but then I'm, I'm at, it's like not eccentric weird, just like insular weird. Like, okay, you're not talking. The village was also released 15 years ago. Now the village gets a lot of shit, catches a lot of heat for the ending, the twist. Cause M night Shyamalan always feels like he's got to include a twist, which I don't mind. I like twists. This twist was, a, I mean, you know, spoiler alert. I mean, you should watch it if you haven't. So if you want to fast forward, whatever. So this twist here, there's a uh, community, and it appears as if this community is in 1600s, 1700s, like pilgrim times, you know? And there are these creatures hunting down people, and they look super badass, like long claws, and they're wearing like robes. So like almost human-esque, these creatures, and they, they just look like just fearsome beasts that can move real quick. And they're terrorizing this community. And you find out, no creatures. It's the elders dressing up like creatures to scare the youngins. And why are they scaring the youngins? Because they don't want them venturing outside this community. Because the community is actually in a modern day wildlife reservation. A park for animals and whatnot. And they have somehow made this arrangement that no modern technology infiltrates it. No planes fly over it. Which, I mean, that's impressive. Multiple decades of that not happening. You know, you've done your homework. Kudos. But yeah, you see the uh, the blind girl scales the wall, and then you see her. You're thinking, oh, where is she going? What's going to happen? And she's on a. You see a road, and you see a car, and you're like, fuck, dude. Whoa. Okay, we're modern day. This is what's going on. And that's when you find out that all of this community is made of people who were abused, had tragedies murders, rape, etc. And they wanted to escape the crime-ridden modern culture, civilization. They said, no thanks, we're going to go back to simpler times. And then they created creatures to scare the, the, the bejesus out of their kids. It's a little twisted. But I get it, I understand. I don't, I don't, it gets a bad rap. I mean, if you don't appreciate I mean, I can see, like, uh, hating the twist is a bit much, dude. Get a life. But I appreciate the twist. It's like it had a kind of a valid backstory. 
leaders use fear sometimes to protect their own. Again, I can hear people screaming Trump, not a political podcast, not a political show. Oh, dude, once upon a time in Hollywood, hit theaters. I don't know a damn thing about this movie, but I have to see it. And originally I'm like, uh, Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, Leo. Why am I not hearing more about this? Like I'm seeing imagery, you know, posters and whatnot, but I haven't seen any trailers. I'm not getting a lot of pub as far as I could see. I don't know. Maybe I'm living under a fucking rock, but like I just didn't. And in, in the July release, I'm like, it's kind of close to August. August is like almost like a dead zone, a cemetery, you know, not studios release movies in the August time period when they're not great. So I, I didn't think it was going to be anything. I thought it was going to be like expendables or grownups. Like, let's just get a bunch of A-listers together to hang out and party and we'll make a movie on the side. Nope. This one's good. As far as I've read, I've seen you know, people are ranking it like third top three out of Tarantino's films. He's made nine or 10 and this is third. I saw a lights, camera, bar stool, gave it like a 95 out of a hundred. One of the best movies of 2019. And of course our date night, I was like, let's do it. The wife was like, I'm on board. Great. Do you think we went immediately bought tickets? No, we figured it's a Sunday night. We got plenty of time. There will be no one in this, no one in the theater. We'll have the theater to ourselves. And I got to apologize to Quentin Tarantino. I am sorry. Big time. We got there. We're already late. But we think, eh, no problem. People will be going to see Lion King. If that Spider-Man movie is still in theaters, it'll probably be at that. Totally forgetting that summer and that like college kids, high school kids, all kids of all ages are not in school the next day. They got nothing to do, plenty of time to kill. So they're just seeing anything and everything. And I think that's what happened there because we go to buy the tickets and it's like, uh, you want two? We'll give you one. And there was a split second where I was like, please let me see this. Please let me see this. But no, I didn't bring it up to the wife. I thought, oh, okay. We won't be able to see it. Date night. We went to uh, Brio Tuscan Grill, great Italian place. Um, and you, you, you ever go to a restaurant and you're kind of running lit behind schedule and like every second feels like a minute when you're trying to catch a movie. That's what was happening. It's like, we're trying to enjoy date night, but we're also trying to cut corners and streamline everything. You know, we go, we go sit at the bar because we think the bar would be quicker, but then the bartender is like making all kinds of drinks for the people that are not at the bar. And you're like, Oh my God, what's happening? But yeah, fettuccine, shrimp and lobster. So good. Not heavy on the cream. You know, sometimes you get the fettuccine that's heavy on the cream and you're like too much cream. Back it up, back it off. I don't need this much cream. I don't need a bowl of cream in my belly. Perfect amount of cream. Had the beef medallions, which can't go wrong there. And then we missed the movie. Couldn't go. So we went to cheesecake factory. Cause, uh, you know, can't go wrong there, but I'm, you know, ever since they started putting the calorie counts next to the menu items, like it just <laughs> such a buzzkill. Like, I just want to enjoy cheesecake. And, I, and my wife doesn't like cheesecake. Not a huge fan. Like I am. So I'm like, you know what? You pick. There's a ton of cheesecakes here. That's how much I love cheesecake. And of course, yeah. She thought I was going to say, that's how much I love you. And I said, that's how much I love cheesecake. Ooh, a date night. <laughs> Not great. But yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. Of course, my camera just dropped. So date night. No, total bust. We had a good time. A lot of uh, positive, constructive criticism. <laughs> you know, I have some things I need to work on. Uh, the Zombieland 2 trailer hit the interwebs. I gotta say, loved it. I'm glad they took their time with it. This time, I think they're at the White House. And I dig how they're doing like the Seinfeld-esque episode where they meet their doppelgangers or they meet like... 
their counterparts in another group. Dig it. Who is it? Uh, Luke Wilson is like the Tallahassee um, Woody Harrelson character. They have uh, the kid from Silicon Valley. The kid. He's a grown man. Jesus Christ. Um, God, I'm hit Thomas Hiddle's ditch. No, Thomas middle. The, the guy from Silicon Valley. He looks like Zuckerberg. Ironically, which is great. Perfect casting. He plays Jesse Eisenberg's counterpart. It's just, they nailed it. Definitely going to try and uh, catch that when it comes out. And then we watch cold pursuit. Cold Pursuit with Liam Neeson. Now, I feel like this didn't do as well at the box office as it probably could have because right around that time, he had an interview with uh, Good Morning America and he made some comments about how a friend of his got raped or beaten and he said he wanted to kill that black bastard but not knowing that the person who did it was black or maybe he did, so... Of course, that caused a huge controversy, and I, 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 I would have to think that had to play in the way in the minds of people that were debating whether or not to see it. You know, good movie, not great. Um, it it kind of was described by I think like AOL or something as like a darkly comedic thriller, and I mean it was a it was had dark comedy elements to it, but not very like. You know, you're not laughing at every scene. It's just here and there. You're just like, oh, that's that's rich. I got a little giggle out of one or two things. They had the running gag of putting up the person's name as they're ta- as they as they uh, as they die. And there were a couple things that stood out to me. Three things or four things. Oh, there's a few things. First of all. There's spoilers if you want to skip over it. There, check the timestamps. But Laura Dern, what is she doing in this movie? If you've seen it, she's in it for like two seconds. And the one scene, it's her and Liam Neeson, her husband. She plays Liam Neeson's wife. And they're having a talk. And it's like, okay, we've kind of drifted apart. But things aren't that bad. They're not on the rocks per se. It's just, you know. And he gives a speech at the beginning of the the, the episode because he got Citizen of the Year. And he's like kind of looking at his wife and he's saying, I chose the right path. And you're thinking, okay, so things seem good. Maybe not the best, maybe not perfect, but like they're getting through it. Then the son dies and the wife is like, "Uh, go fuck yourself. Just pieces out, leaves a blank card. Savage. I don't, I don't liberally throw around savage. I probably shouldn't be using the word savage, but that was savage. Blank card. No words. Took everything that she owned and pieced out. I mean, what? Do we need Laura Dern for that? My theory is, I mean, you could have got anyone to play that part, in my opinion. But I think they got Laura Dern because they're like, listen, the way we have it now, I don't know that we're going to have a lot of... (laughs) women seeing this movie and if we want to get guys to see the movie maybe they're a little bit older they probably have a wife or a girlfriend how do we get the wife or girlfriend on board with this movie Laura Dern I mean they had Emmy Rossum who was good but yeah I mean I just what a waste of Laura Dern man and then they just leave it hanging and you're just like so many questions about what just happened right there I understand you know the son getting murdered tragic you know made to look like a heroin overdose not the case spoiler but you know and that that was kind of in the back of our heads especially uh, my wife Cass she was just like I need to know what the hell just happened there because that was seemed a little too drastic um Emmy Rossum's partner the old guy who's got like 30 years experience her her cop partner who like how is he not in on how is he not corrupt and like with white bull and viking and all them the drug dealers in fact he's like nah, 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 nah. i mean yeah i guess if you're a veteran of you know 30 years on the force you're just kind of like i don't want to do any of this anymore <laughs> i just want to retire i just want the gold watch 
Like, I get that. And it's a small town cop, too. It's not like a, I mean, I don't know. You'd think a small town cop would kind of be like, all right, some fucking action for once in my life. The big town cop is the one who's like, yeah, you know, I'm so goddamn corrupt. I just don't want to deal with this anymore. But the small town cop, you'd think he'd be more about it, bad about it. Um, we were not high on the villain Viking. I don't know the actor's name, but I mean, he did his job. He's not a likable guy. You're not supposed to like the villain. Although some of the better movies out there, they make you like the villain and then you feel like an a-hole because you're like, I'm in love with the villain. Damn it. How can I root against this guy? But yeah, we rooted against them pretty hard. <laughs> it's like you stink out loud. And, uh, so that's why I was confused by the ending. Cause it white bull. It's like Viking kills white bull's son. White bull wants revenge on Viking and says son for son. Now you have to remember Vikings dad kind of ran the show and was like a partner with white bull. They had an agreement. So I read it as Viking has a son. Let's go kill that son. And I'm like, that's cool blooded. I mean, the son is like 10, 11 years old, maybe eight. Very precocious. Great casting job. Actor did a great job. But I read it. I heard that and I was like, all right, they're going to kill a kid, which is wow. So you have that shootout at the end at where Liam Neeson works and they kill Viking. And the only People left are Liam Neeson, White Bull, and the son, Viking son. And I'm thinking, nice. All right. Now Liam Neeson has to go against White Bull because White Bull wants to kill the son. Instead, you got Liam Neeson just driving away in like a snowblower. And White Bull like climbs into the cab. And they just kind of like look at each other and nod. And it's just like, that's the ending. Ugh. And of course, then they have the, the one of the other Native Americans nicknamed Avalanche, who's still parachuting, apparently. He's been parachuting for like days. And he just flies into the snowblower and dies. It's like, oh, I guess it's a fitting ending. Yeah, you, you tend to overthink or I tend to overthink things like that. It's like it could have been so good. Could have been great. It's still watchable, though. <laughs> um. Oh, and the last two things on Cold Pursuit. So there was the Elway or Manning debate, which I'd have to think is like pretty much contained to Denver, the Denver metropolitan area, because both guys played for Denver. And uh, my wife was like, so what do you think, Elway or Manning? I was like, oh, okay. Wifey wants to get into the sports talk arena with me, um, which rarely happens. So I was excited, a little too excited. I was like, I don't know, where do I begin? <laughs> do you have 15 hours to talk about this? No, okay. Um, on a personal level, I would take Elway. He's just a gunslinger. He's got that kind of cowboy feel to him. Um, slings it around. Powerful, strong arm. Of course, the cats. It's like the, the timing with these cats is just amazing. Like you had all day to ask me for food and now you're going to ask me for food. Uh, so yeah, I was, I would have gone with Elway. I mean, I'm sure if you look at the numbers, like Manning is, I believe owns almost all the major passing records. Um, but you could also make an argument that like Elway played in an era of football that wasn't really pass happy. That just wasn't the game plan. It was like establish the run throw off the run, et cetera. And I think Elway actually helped develop, you know, the past first mentality. So it was a case of timing, you know, Manning comes in and like everyone's throwing the ball. It's the run and gun style offense. Manning, obviously more cerebral intellectual, I guess, than Elway. I think Elway more elusive was able to scramble at least early on in his career, maybe not later. And, you know, you look at the postseason. I don't know, you know, it's like, but they're very similar. I mean, Manning didn't enjoy postseason success for a while. Came in the league like 98. He didn't have his first Super Bowl until 09, no, 06. You know, not great in the postseason. His record stinks. But then I think about Elway and I'm like, well, dude was friggin' uh, 0 and 4 in Super Bowls. At least he got the Super Bowl. So I don't know. I'm going with Elway. <laughs> And that's that. 
last thing with cold pursuit <laughs> we i can't believe we had a discussion about this but one of the guys in vikings crew talks about how he travels a lot he goes to like a hundred motels over the course of a year and his trick is that he'll put this uh sign on the door saying need service for the maids to know to go in and clean the room and then he'll lie naked on the bed with a $20 bill over his dong. And it works, quote unquote, 33% of the time. So 100, mo- 100 motels, 100 maids, 33 of those maids he's having sex with? Getting a beach? I don't know. It sounded like he was having sex with them. And my wife was like, no way, way too high. And she's, and she's like, money denomination too low 20 bucks and the number of uh, women that actually agreed to this way too high and i was like yeah but like look at that guy like he's going to motels and even said it when he was explaining it to his his uh, buddy in the car he's like these maids make eight dollars and 36 cents an hour twenty dollars considerable amount of money it's you know two or three hours of work which they could probably, and they might enjoy it because look at the guy. So yeah, $20 might be a little too low. 33% conversion rate, probably a little too high, but look at the dude. If his buddy, that old fuck was doing it, everything, the money domination goes way up. Conversion rate goes way down. So yeah, if we have any maids watching this, Hit me up. Let me know. Would you, would you go, would you do that? Sex with the the hot stranger for 20 bucks. Small town motels. Maids who probably don't get a guy like that coming through that often and offering themselves up. (laughs) And that, that spawned the biggest discussion between me and my wife. We were doing the math, crunching the numbers. Oh boy. All right. Now we get into the sports section of the show. We're talking Mets first, and then we'll talk about the Giants. Uh, we'll do a real quick this week in Mets history uh, before we get to the, all the trade talk and whatnot. Um, got some good feedback on this section before, so why not stick with it? July 24th, 1993. Vince Coleman. Yeah. That's, I mean, that, if you're a Mets fan, that's all I got to say. Vince frickin coleman tosses an m80 firecracker from a car multiple injuries at uh dodger stadium 11 year old boy two-year-old girl i mean dear god (laughs) and he was in he was a passenger in a car driven by eric davis who played for the dodgers and he he did it as a joke i mean i was so excited when the mets got vince coleman I thought, wow, we got a guy who's a legend when it comes to stealing bases. He murdered us on the base pass repeatedly whenever we played the Cardinals. Now we got him. That 93 team, oh, furious about that 93 team. Saberhagen, I think we had Bonilla, Coleman, Burnitz, and then we didn't do shit. We had stuff like that going on. Tossing firecrackers and like shooting bleach at reporters. Dear God, you kind of think it was like the 86 Mets without actually winning. (laughs) You know, uh, that same day in 2015, Michael Conforto makes his debut. Not bad. July 28th, 93. Um, (laughs) uh, Anthony Young ends ends his 27 game losing streak. And uh, he said his quote afterwards was, that wasn't even a big monkey that was on my back. It was a zoo. The guys treated it like I'd won a World Series game for them. I mean, you know, it's a pretty big deal, dude. And I I remember this is tied to last week's This Week in Mets history. I guess one of the pitchers that I'd mentioned who pitched a complete game but lost and was one of three pitchers, starting pitchers on the Mets who did that, actually owned the previous record for uh, the longest losing streak in it. And he was pissed when Anthony Young broke it. You know, sometimes we just want a record. Maybe it's a bad record, but we want it. And I get that. 
And I, I think at one point I was rooting for Anthony Young. I was like, keep losing, baby. At least we've got something going for us. I actually went to a game that year back at the old uh, Shea Stadium. I almost got an Anthony Young jersey. I was like, you know what? I'm going to embrace this suck. Uh, that same day in 2011 uh, is when Zach Wheeler, we got him. We sent Beltron to the Giants for uh, for Wheeler. And now Wheeler's probably on the way out. Although, you know, Francesa, Mike Francesa on WFAN, he was saying that he would totally keep Wheeler for one year, $18 million. That's a lot of moolah for a guy who's streaky. But then again, you look at the starting rotation after the Stroman trade, not so bad. Stroman, Syndergaard, Wheeler, Mats, DeGrom. Especially if Mats can stay hot. And that's, you know, there's so many ifs. God damn it. July 29th, 1996. Uh, you want to talk about bad trades. And a lot of people are giving the Mets shit for the Stroman trade. I don't know why, but they're, they're saying it's one of the worst trades ever. And it's like, get over yourself. You want to know a bad trade? How about the Jeff Kent trade, dude? Sent Jeff Kent and Jose Vizcaino to the Indians for Carlos Bayerga and Alvaro Espinosa. Yikes, dude. Kent went on to win, uh, win the MVP. Hall of Fame numbers. 17 years. Bayerga stunk. That one hurt. Because I was really excited about that. I was like, Carlos Bayerga? What? And I remember he got like the dink. His first hit was like this dinky grounder down the third baseline. And I was like, I don't know if I like this guy anymore. He struggled so much during that friggin' year. Ugh, just a long history of like acquisitions that just. Ugh. Speaking of which, July thirtieth, two thousand four, fifteen years ago, the infamous. Victor Zambrano, Chris Benson, Scott Casimir trade. Um, we send Ty Wigginton, Ty Wigginton, who was like a rookie of the year finalist in 03, uh, to the Pirates, along with Jose Batista, Joey Bats for Chris Benson. And then we obviously send Chris uh, Scott Casimir, our like top left-handed pitching prospect, to the Rays for Victor Zambrano. I did not realize how bad Zambrano was. I mean, he's not awful, but like he, nothing, nothing makes the blood flow with this guy. And we said in Casimir. Benson actually, you know, people forget, but Benson actually pitched his best with the Mets. <laughs> if you look at his career numbers, they're actually like his best efforts with the Mets. And of course, his wife was a psychopath who threatened to sleep with the entire Mets roster if uh, Chris ever cheated. So he had that going on. Always nice to have baggage, not to call her baggage, but like, you know, it's a lot to deal with. And of course, Casimir went on to have like, you know, a pretty good career, solid career, 12 plus years, 100 plus wins, three time all star. But the thing that I pointed out in my blog post about this was he didn't stay with the Rays the entire time. It's not like he was a lifelong Ray. He pitched for like five, six other teams. But you look at the ensuing years, say we keep Casimir in 04. Maybe he comes up in 05. Maybe we keep him for 06, 07, 08. The entire Mets franchise history is rewritten. 05, maybe we make the playoffs. 06, we win the World Series. 07, 08, maybe we don't collapse. I mean, 07, 08, it was a matter of one game. One or two games. You got to think Casimir gives you that one or two extra wins. And we, we're not talking about the most epic monumental collapses in baseball or professional sports history. And who knows what they do in the playoffs? Oh, yeah, it stings. You tend to forget about it until you look at that that run that we had and how it was just wasted. And we didn't get right that World Series win. Ugh. Joey Bats. I mean, that's the other thing. Batista didn't like become an all-star silver slugger until years later. So it's kind of like 
you're being a little obnoxious when you if you're going to say that Batista was going to stay with the Mets the entire time and then additionally he's we're going to stick with him for the fucking 5 or 6 years that he wasn't doing jack shit and then he goes off you know i mean you can't i don't know Oh, prospects too. Like people get so high on prospects and it's like, think I would love to know the percentage of prospects, top prospects that actually pan out because I don't think it's that high. It's like Casimir. Okay. He, 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 he turned out to be a pretty solid pitcher. I mean, he's not, I don't think he's like Cy Young hall of fame material. I don't think but there are a bunch of prospects we've traded over the years and they don't do shit after we trade them. And I'll get to that with the Stroman trade. But I'm with this 2016 on this day, uh, Mike Piazza, the greatest hitting catcher in baseball history, gets his number retired and is inducted into the baseball hall of fame. And then his speech, he says, well, due respect to Tom Hanks, there is crying in baseball. So Piazza, so I like how there's double mentions. That's two weeks in a row I've mentioned Tom Hanks, multiple mentions of Tom Hanks. You know, if you want the Mets to turn around, maybe you get Tom Hanks in, in the fucking clubhouse in the locker room, give a little pep talk. As, what's his name in that? Jimmy Dugan. <laughs> It'll turn things around. Piazza, it's another guy that deserved a World Series win. No thanks fucking Barry Larkin um all right so that's it that is this week in Mets history uh moving on to more important stuff more current present stuff I saw this tweet the Mets have the most negative contract value in baseball sounds a lot like the Giants uh and that's attributed to Robinson Cano Ioannis Cespedes Yuris Familia Jed Lowry $158.6 $158.6 million sunk in those goddamn players. And of course, Cano has his, has like a three home run game, his first three home run game of his career. And then he went like one for 20. It's the 14th time in Mets history that's happened. Three home runs in a single game. God damn it. Fucking Cano. And now there's talk about how they're going to DFA him, designate him for assignment. Can you even do that with that contract? Holy shit. That's just, ugh. Chad Larry, laughable, dude. Laughable. On the uh, July 26, 2015, uh, we're going to dabble. We'll go back in history. 2015 kept uh, coming up a lot this week. In his fourth at bat with the Mets, Recently acquired infielder Juan Uribe, Uribe won it in the 10th inning with a walk-off hit. That was an excellent addition. And, you know, Uribe, it's not, he's not exactly getting the sorority girls all wet in the panty area. But yet he contributed. He was an important part of that team. And that's what I... Uh, and that's what I mentioned. Someone had tweeted out, like, this is the four-year anniversary of Wilma Flores crying on the field. The Mets were 52 and 49 when that happened, when he thought he was going to the Brewers with Wheeler for Carlos Gomez. They were 52 and 49 when that 49 when that happened. They went 38 and 23 afterwards, thanks to Yoanis Cespedes. Yoanis. And I just wrote back, you know, sometimes it's just a you're a couple players away. Sometimes you're seven players away. And then people have been saying that about the Mets, like, oh, congrats on Stroman. That's one guy. You need more than one guy. Well, it's not over yet, dude. Settle your britches. July 24th, 2015, Kelly Johnson and Juan, Re- Juan Uribe. Kelly Johnson was an important part of that team. 727, July 27th, Tyler Clippard. Bullpen help. And of course, 31st, we got Yo. On the 4th, this is actually after the trade deadline, which, you know, you expect me to know all the friggin' rules of baseball? No thanks. August 4th, Eric O'Flaherty, who I think, specialist, lefty maybe. 822, Eric Young Jr. from the Braves. Eric Young Jr. 
was a, our pinch rudder runner extraordinaire, stolen base artist. And then, of course, on uh, August 30th, Addison Reed, all of those players contributed to that run. Yeah. We're not doing 80 to 90% of what we're doing in that postseason without Daniel Murphy. I get it. But each of those players contributed to them going 38 and 23 down the stretch and to advance to the World Series. So, you know, for people saying, oh, you're multiple pieces away, it can happen. It did happen four years ago. So let's talk about it. Marcus Stroman. I think it's a good trade. I don't see why everyone is so up in arms about it. You know, we give up the number four prospect. We give up the number six prospect. And so, you know, Joel Sherman, the New York post is making, uh, comparisons saying this is the 2004 trade all over again. Nah, dead. Nah. Anthony K just got the triple a, you know, and maybe he does great things. Simeon Woods Richardson is the number six prospect. He's only two spots behind freaking K and no one's even talking about him. Things can happen. Yeah, sure. Maybe they can go out and be amazing. But this team is not that far off from contending. And I know I can see everyone rolling their eyes. Here we go again. Delusional as hell. How can you be this delusional? I don't know. Something's wrong with my brain. Not wired correctly. But if we were 52 and 49 when we made the trade for Yo four years ago, we're 50 and 55 now. You take away a bunch of those blown saves. Maybe they, if they swept the Giants, we're kind of in that same area as we were four years ago. We know our weaknesses. We know where we need to improve. And there are players out there who can help us get to where we need to go. There are a shit ton of relief pitchers available that we can go after. We have the chips here and there. Deals can be made. You don't want to obviously mortgage your future or fuck your future. I don't see them doing that. The Stroman trade was good. This guy is from Long Island. Looks to be a Mets fan. He's going to put his all into this. He was at Johan Santana's no hitter. He looks, he sounds excited to be a Met. That's, that's a good thing. Because if he knows the history, he knows you, once you put on a Mets uniform, you're cursed and you don't play as well as you normally do. But I like what they have going now. Steven Matz throws his first career complete game shutout. So now he's back to where he needs to be, hopefully. But you, you look at him and you say, if we do somehow make it to the postseason, DeGrom, Syndergaard, Stroman are your starters. Throw Mats in the bullpen. Who knows where Wheeler falls into everything? They're not done. I'm convinced that they're not done. There's talks about, you know, Diaz getting traded to the Red Sox. Buster Only is reporting that they're interested in third base prospect Bobby Dalbeck. Eh. Corner infielder Tristan Casas. Uh, okay. I'm not getting like boned up over that. You give me Jackie Bradley Jr., though. Now we are talking. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's a win now move, the Stroman trade. Jason Vargas trade, I don't know. You know, that one kind of is perplexing. It's like we knew he was going, but like to it's a salary dump and we're getting this double a catcher that hits below the Mendoza. I don't know that the returns are that great, unless you're going to use that cash to make a big signing either on the, in the off season or yeah, in the off season, you're going to make some kind of blockbuster trade for a high salary guy. Yes. You know, Nicholas Castellano, Castellano, someone who's earning a lot of cash and you need the cash to resign them in the offseason because they're obviously going to do great things for the Mets and lead us into the promised land and you want to keep them. So uh, that's the Vargas trade in a nutshell, in my mind. Yeah, odds are it probably won't happen, but it's like, that's what they do. They know we're traumatized, the Wilpons. 
They know it. They've told Brody, hey, just dangle the carrot and they'll go for it. They do it every time. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sucking it up. I believe. Stupid, but like, what else what do I have going on? The Giants season is over, so what the fuck? Two general managers predict Zach Wheeler will land with the Astros. <laughs> Considering the Astros are one of the better teams in the majors, they probably got a deep roster. Hopefully an outfielder. That'd be nice. Bullpen arm. I'll take that. And then there was an article, I guess, uh, I guess this is Sports Illustrated again. I'm so like off of Sports Illustrated, but they said the Mets would be foolish to trade Noah Syndergaard. Do you even know what you're talking about anymore? The Mets would be foolish to trade Odell Beckham Jr. It, well, now that's looking pretty bad. But give it some time. We got a lot of quality pieces for Odell. Not as many as I would want. Probably could have used one more player, but... If it all pans out, we look like geniuses. For you to be that closed-minded and say, don't trade Noah Syndergaard at all costs, you're an idiot. You have to keep the phone lines open, my man. You got to see what's out there, what's available. If someone's stupid enough, to, or not stupid enough, but if they're, someone's willing to throw some top talent your way that can help you either this year or the next year, you're just dude, no thanks because it's Noah? No, come on. I mean, you, you got to entertain it just a little bit. But this, to me, it's like, especially, I know, I know, we're, and I know we, we beat the Padres and we beat the Pirates and we still have to bite our fingernails down to the bone with, uh, with Diaz and the bullpen. And there's a tougher road to hoe ahead. But, it's momentum. I don't I don't know. They play games like they have over the past week, and you're like, dude, why not? Why not us? Why can't us, to borrow a Phillies phrase? Ugh. So, yeah, I, I mean, they got to do something with the outfield. That's for damn sure. I mean, Dom Smith and left. Holy shit. Michael Conforto in center. I don't, I mean, that's just like, I'm really, that's the most perplexing thing is that he's like misjudging the fuck out of balls in center field. Like get a clue, dude. So yeah, I, I, I think there's still moves to be made and I think there's going to be a series of moves or at least they should be, you know, a Vargas trade. That was pretty, you want to talk about bad trades? I mean, it's not like the worst trade. It depends on what they do with that. All that cash they're saving, apparently. But I mean, the theory going around is that they know that his time is up and that this is all like fake gold. You know what I mean? Like none of this is real and that he's, he's going to end up shitting the bed. So might as well have the Phillies, the ones shit the bed. Cause you know that he's going to shit the bed. So it's like, Oh, addition to the Phillies. And then we can leapfrog the Phillies or we have inside information about how to beat Jason Vargas. He left his uh, diary out on the, on the bench in the clubhouse and we all read it. So we all know what he's, what his tips, his tip offs. Yeah. You know, he's got the blinker on. We know which way he's going and we're going to smash him when we face him. Keep your friends close. Keep your enemies closer. I don't know. I can reason you to death, my man. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's just a couple pieces away. It just feels like it's a couple pieces. The fact that we were able to land Stroman ahead of all the other contenders, Yankees, Braves, blah, blah, blah. I like that. And I think other players are going to take notice and be like, okay. I would like to play with this team, knowing that they have a lot of young talent and they know uh, we've admitted to our mistakes. We're not going to try and force anything anymore. Let's shuffle some pieces around. Let's make it happen. All right. And that's, that's Mets talk for this week. I mean, you know, knowing my fucking luck, like, you know, 
McNeil will uh, get in a gardening accident and like Alonzo will get caught with like in an embezzling scheme or something like that and then all fall apart. But for right now, feeling pretty good. If this is the only move they make, that stinks. But I, I, I they got two or three moves left in them. I really do believe that. And then to eat, to drink the tears of everyone that counted them out and, con- and canceled and consoled. I, uh, I still haven't consoled, by the way. Not to be that guy, but like, why not? You know, I don't, I mean, it, the Marlins are a thorn in our side for some reason. <laughs> but I like our odds. All right, let's move on to the Giants, even though it's like, you know, good God. The curse of Odell Beckham is real. That much is, I'm sure about. There's no doubt in my mind. Sterling Shepard fractures his thumb day one and is probably going to miss all preseason. Who knows how he's going to be week one. Okay, that stinks. I guess I can live with that. We still have Golden Tate. We still have Corey Coleman. You know, we'll work around it. We got other weapons. Barkley Ingram. Corey Coleman tears his ACL down for the season. <sighs> Feel for Corey Coleman big time, dude. I mean, this was the the comeback of the year story. Former first round draft pick considered a bust passed over through the bills and the pats. People were giving up on him left and right. He looks like a fool on hard knocks. And now he's going to be a contributor. He's going to be weapon X. He's the secret weapon, the X factor in this season return guy, a returner who, who looked good returning the ball last year. You pair him up with Jabril peppers returning the ball. And you, now you're starting to get better field position. Tears is the ACL. And I put out a video. I mean, I looked like dog shit. I haven't shaved in a couple days, and I had like the Ace Ventura, like uh, Cameron Diaz hair from there, something about Mary. But I had to put it out there. What is going on? I suggested that an Eagles fan or perhaps a Cowboys fan, maybe even a Redskins fan, has some kind of voodoo doll collection, and they're just poking and prodding with the pins. That's the only explanation. And Odell Beckham is somehow related. He's a powerful man, a lot of money, a lot of connections. This is his way of getting back at us. Fucking voodoo, man. You thought I lost it then. I started to, I was reeling and I started to rationalize as I always do when the chips are down. Okay, we're depleted, we're injured, but now we're going to come together around Golden Tate. And he's a veteran leader. He's going to say, guys, I got this. Then he gets suspended for four games. PEDs. I mean, come on. On dude, at least space out the bad news. Like, don't clump it up all into one ball over the span of 24 to 48 hours. Like, and I reacted poorly, as I always do. I wrote a tweet because I was I was literally at a memorial service. Cassie's cousin of unfortunately passed away, uh, very prematurely, very young, 42 years old, I think. Um, I didn't know him. I never met him, but you know, you get to, you get to know the person pretty well at their memorial service. They had pictures up, you know, people pass the mic and we're telling stories and you start to relate to that person. He's a Cowboys fan. I'm not going to hold it against them, but I wrote a tweet. I'm at him. I literally got the news about Golden Tate at the memorial service, right smack dab in the middle of it. I said, I'm at a memorial service, and I asked the funeral director if he had time for us to say a few words about the New York Giants season. RIP. Because, I mean, I don't know that you can bounce back from this. I'm a weirdly optimistic dude. I, you know, I'm pessimistic, but positive. Like, there's always, like, 
yeah, I mentioned it before, just like 1% of me. That's just like, but it would be cool. So in the moment, I was like, cancel the season. We're done. We're, we're cooked. There's no way we can p- compete. People had their doubts about us with everyone fucking healthy. And now we got all of our res- receiving core. Like it's 2017 all over again. We're going to have Rhett Ellison lining wide. Simonson in the slot. It's like, holy shit. Just running like screens and flats and hitches and oh slants. <laughs> And it sucked. And the way that Golden Tate got suspended too. Fertility drugs, dude. Ugh, you're making so much money. You don't have anyone on your friggin' around you that can be like, let me just check what's going into your body real quick. Let me just take a look. You're basically a king, dude. Get yourself a taste tester. They croak. It's fine. Keep your body, and this is where, you know, I mean, Odell spends millions on his body. He's made that very clear. And Golden Tate just wanted to have a baby, and now he's suspended four games. And, I mean, you got to think that. It's like, I don't know who's going to fill the void. I really don't. Coleman, it's like, Coleman was the wild card. In my mind, he was the deep threat that was going to replace Odell down the field make a couple big catches, you know, loosen up the defense a little. He's gone, and it's like now we got guys that just run short routes. And now we don't have anyone. (laughs) Oh, God. It's, you know, I'm being tested. I get it. And now all those predictions about, like, 5 and 11 are, like, that's the most optimistic I can. I feel like I can get, you know, and, and I was doing a lot of backpedaling in my blog post about Golden Tate suspension. I was saying, hey, look at the 86 and 90 Super Bowl teams. We had Stephen Baker and Bobby Johnson and Stacey Robinson and Mark Ingram. And like none of those guys were like thousand yard receivers. And maybe that's the, the cure. Just get back to that 80s smash mouth late 80s, early 90s smash mouth football where we're just running the ball down your throat with Saquon. I don't know. Hopefully success is cyclical in the NFL. I just, I don't know. I would love for that to happen. I mean, I just, if Darius Slayton can just take care of that fucking hamstring and be ready for week one, whatever he needs to do, do it and then you gotta hope that i mean they're saying that benny fowler i read today that benny fowler is like the guy who's flying under the radar that could really help the offense and blah blah and i'm like uh okay i guess latimer was going to be a a cut a veteran cut possibly and now it's like he's absolutely required (sighs) fertility drugs dude Fertility drugs. Just wanted a baby. <laughs> and he didn't tell anyone prior to signing. Thanks, Golden. I was, you know, get that money. And now that whole video of him reenacting Cuba Gooden Jr.'s uh, scene from Jerry Maguire. Not so funny. Yeah, yeah. Show you the money. We showed you the money and you showed us a failed drug test over fertility drugs, dude. God damn it. And the, like, and the multiple people are like, it's a zero toler- tolerance policy. There's no way he's going to get it reduced. He's going to get four games. And I'm thinking to myself, didn't someone like beat the piss out of their girlfriend or wife and had like eight games reduced to four or someone smoked weed and got four to, you know, it's like, there's always rules to the exception. And in the blog post, I actually brought up, uh, you know, the scene in The Sopranos when AJ vandalizes the pool at this at Verbum Day. And they're like, we have a zero tolerance power policy. And they're like, oh, shit, here it comes. I'm going to get expelled. And then sure enough, they're like, yeah, we'll let the parents punish them. Zero tolerance. 
There's an exception to every rule, dude. And you're going to see that this we're going to have the Golden Tate rule. Fertility drugs, all right, we get it. I mean, if he can honestly prove that, you're really going to give this guy the same amount as someone who, who is a domestic abuser? What the hell kind of example are you setting for the fucking league? You're already getting enough heat from people about like how you handle violence off the field. Guy just wants a family. The, the pressure that's on that kid, by the way, holy shit. Like you are the reason that <laughs> could be the reason the Giants missed the playoffs in 2019. Not that anyone was expecting us to go to the playoffs, but like it's a, it's a burden to bear. You, your parents are going to shield you from that, but like you, you're going to eventually down the road, you're going to find out like, Hey, my dad was suspended because of me. Oh yeah. Yeah. In that article where they were talking about, uh, you know, they reported that golden Tate was suspended. They listed the free agents that are available. It is a murderer's row of problematic wide receivers. Kelvin, Benjamin, Michael Crabtree, Des Bryant, Pierre Garçon, Mike Wallace. Yikes, dude. Calvin Benjamin just like refuses to warm up with his quarterback pregame and he's got a bit of a weight problem, which I have one, so I can identify with that. But he's just, I don't know. He's a big body. You got to think that like he's got to help out in the goal line situation, red zone, hopefully. I don't know. There were reports that he was supposed to work out for them, and then he he wasn't on the final list. It's like, okay. I had someone tweeted back to me when I said they should consider signing, just invite all these people in. They're like, not Michael Crabtree. He's a drop machine. I'm like, yeah, his catch percentage, not great. But none of these catch, the catch percentage on a lot of these guys isn't great. There's no way in hell you should consider Des Bryant. Just no, no, hard pass. Pierre Garçon has, just hasn't played the past two seasons. And Mike Wallace, I mean, he played two games last year. I guess for the Eagles, I don't know. Crabtree is the only one who's really stayed on the field. So if I had to pick one guy, it would be Crabtree. And who knows, maybe he's able to catch Eli's balls. Maybe Eli's balls are catchable to Michael Crabtree. <laughs> And of course, Victor Cruz says he's still available. Holy God, Victor. Victor needs to watch or listen to last week's episode about closure. Moving on. Because uh, as much as I'd love to see him come back and like be the guy that always has one clutch catch per game, because that's worth it in my mind to see him get us a, 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 a crucial first down or, or touchdown when we need it. I'd love to see that. Fuck it. As long as he, you know, if he's willing to accept the league minimum, which I doubt he is, bring him in. See what he's got. The, the answer is yes. Like, should the Giants look at Cameron Meredith was another question I had here. Yeah, absolutely. The answer is yes across the board. We're, we're, we're in full-on panic mode right now. We are fully desperate. Beggars can't be choosers. Let's just bring everybody in and see what sticks. Throw them against the wall. And maybe they just, maybe something clicks. They put on the uniform and it's like a whole new world. Oh boy. All right. Well, I'll finish up with this. So yeah, the curse of Odell is a hundred percent real. I'm not denying that at all. And I don't know how to break it. And I'm not, if it's a like curse of the Bambino type shit, that's like a hundred years, 80 plus years. I'm not going to be around or alive to see them win again. Maybe Brielle, my daughter might be able to like see that curse broken. My, my kids, kids, I don't know, but the curse is definitely real. No clue how to break it. We have to sacrifice someone to the gods, I guess, virgin perhaps. Daniel Jones? I don't know. <laughs> Pat Leonard, uh, New York Daily News. So I'll wrap up with this. He had uh, his five biggest questions for the Giants heading into the 2019 season. Number one, when will Daniel Jones take over for Eli Manning? I mean, you know, first half of the season, if you are nowhere near 500, make a move. 
make the move. And then I guess the last, you know, if they're still out of contention by the last home game of the season, then you give Eli the, the courtesy of whatever. But yeah, I think, you know, just get what, just do it. Get him some reps, quality reps. And then 2020 looks better because he's got some game time under, under his wing, under his belt. That expression is so weird. Under your belt. Not a good place to be. So uh, I'll, I'll say this. If it does happen, if. I got to think it's going to happen in the second half of the season, unless there's injury, of course. But like if he's if Eli's healthy and it does happen this year because they are so bad or you know they're not winning, I think it's going to happen in the second half of the season. I just can't see it happening in the first half of the season. I don't think the rope is going to be that short. Or the leash is going to be that tight. Uh, question number two, will the Giants win enough to justify Dave Gettleman's controversial moves? Uh, you know. It doesn't look like that's going to happen this season, maybe next season. Um, I think, you know, for me, for most Giants fans, it's like if they make the playoffs, then it's all worth it. I will say if they have a winning record this year, I think it's worth it. Considering everything that's happened, they go nine and seven. I consider that a, a success, a win. Um, eight and eight. I don't know, seven and nine. I mean, you know, now it's like if they win anything, it's almost got a goddamn miracle. But uh, originally I would say nine and seven, a winning record. Um, controversial moves. I mean, you know, you got to take risks once in a while. You play it safe and nothing happens. Definition of insanity, right? Maybe question number three, which young defensive players will emerge to star for big blue. I said before I'll say it again, Deandre Baker, you know, I think that young crew, uh, although Sam Beal is hurt again, good God, everyone like he's going to be the next coming of fucking Christ. And then he keeps getting hurt. It's like, just stay healthy, dude. But yeah, I'd say Deandre Baker, number one, number two, Julian love continues to get love. <laughs> from everyone that covers the giants is they're just saying he's getting reps at safety. He's kind of going to be all over the field. And it's like, I expect him to get a, a decent amount of snaps this year. And I think sounds like he's going to, I mean, if they're talking about him at safety, it sounds like he's already in the mix and should see plenty of uh, playing time. So Deandre Baker, Julian love, um, Lorenzo Carter, I guess is another guy that they're high on. Um, that made some plays last year and continue to make plays in camp already. And then uh, Dexter Lawrence looks like a fucking monster. Yikes. Oh, I mean, John Hale, Peo, Peo, Peo. He's a big dude, and Lawrence looked bigger and just m more aggressive and just was like, uh, whoa. So happy to have Dexter Lawrence. And then uh, RJ McIntosh is another guy that... I guess had a, he, you know, didn't really contribute last year, but looks to rebound this year. So there's that. Question four: is Saquon Barley, keep Barley, <laughs> Saquon Barkley, capable of an MVP season in year two? Yeah, dumbest question of all time. All right, maybe not now because they don't have any fucking wide receivers, but I still think he's going to be an MVP. I mean, the guy. We didn't have, we wouldn't have had any offense if it weren't for him last season for the first half of the season. The guy is able to make plays when there shouldn't be anything happening. Barry Sanders esque. Which you want to talk about uh, impact player, influential. The memorial service, it was a Cowboys fan. He still had a picture of Barry Sanders among his pictures. He had the Duke hat, another hat, a Flyers guy. Which that's a that's an interesting combination. Cowboys fan, Flyers fan. But uh yeah, Barry Sanders esque. And yeah, I know what you're saying. Barry Sanders, great player, Hall of Fame, but didn't never didn't do well in the playoffs or didn't the Lions never did shit with him on the team. And it's like, all right. 
I still don't mind watching Saquon for 10 years, dude. I'll take that. No Super Bowls. It's tough, but like, oh boy, he's just fun to watch. <laughs> and I know that's like a bananas for me to say, but I don't, I don't give a shit. It, it, it's that enjoyable to me. I'm wearing a Saquon shirt, which you can kind of see. Barstoolsports.com. No free ads. Uh, and the last question, is the culture any different? And will it impact the bottom line? You kind of feel like it's different. And I think that was Gettleman's point. From day one, this guy, the moment he came in, he shook things up. Bobby Hart, peace out. Eric Flowers didn't give him much uh, leeway when it came to the last season. He made moves that previous ownership general managers hesitant to make because they just wanted to see it play out. And by him not signing Landon Collins and trading Odell Beckham and Olivier Vernon, and getting rid of and tra- uh, trading, getting rid of Damon Harrison, Eli Apple, all these moves. were to mold the team in his vision. He has some kind of vision. Those players don't fit within that vision. And I think if he had a lot more success in his previous roles, you know, Belichick-esque record, people are not questioning it. The fact that he only, the Panthers only went to the Super Bowl and lost once, it's like, eh. To me, it feels the culture is different. I don't think you're going to see a lot of throwing people under the bus as much. You know, you can say what you want about Odell. It just feels different. And unfortunately, these injuries are going to be the death of our, of our season. But if they didn't happen, I think you would have saw, you would have seen a different Giants team. And who's to say that it still won't happen? If the offensive line comes around like it does, although Nate Solder has the fucking ankle injury now. And then the guy that they were so high on from, uh, was it Mississippi state? And he's got like concussion or something. It's like, I uh, just hate the, the first week of training camp is all bad news, all bad news. And any good news you get is so overinflated. And, you know, I mean, it's like that Daniel Jones throw the video of Daniel Jones overthrowing that tight end on that one stupid play. And it's like Saquon comes comes and, 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 and responds and is like, hey, the defense made a good play, and Daniel threw it away. Get your mind right. So it's, it's the time of overreaction. Oh, the C.J. Conrad is the next great tight end. Uh, come on. Just t- try to take everything with a grain of salt. Try to breathe and let things process. Let things marinate. Give it some time. People are so quick to jump down everyone's throat, you know, just give it some time. And that's it for this week's show. We're, we're, we're either looking at, uh, we're entering the dark void, the darkest timeline for the Mets and Giants. We're going further into this hellish landscape or we're coming out. We're just pulling out of it and we're going to make something of it. When they're counting us out, when the when the when the dawn is darkest, it's always darkest before the dawn. Yeah, this is the, right before the dawn. This is where we are. We're coming around. It's going to happen. If not this year, next year. That's all I got. So hopefully, uh, call the voicemail line. I didn't even check it, but eight six two B I T nineteen eighty six. You can call me about whatever, dude. I do not care. Just call. Let me know what actually works. And then, uh, and leave me a voicemail and we'll talk about it. All right. That's it. Adios, muchachos.